Hey, welcome back for more proteomics. And the next video in this series is now going to focus on something a little bit different than what we talked about last time with protein folding and chaperones and everything there. Uh, so we're gonna ta talk about once a protein has been synthesized by the ribosome and once it has folded into its native state, what are some things that can actually happen to the protein afterwards that can help to regulate its function. So that's gonna be the focus of our discussion here on post-translational modifications. So the idea here is that even once the whole translation process is over, once the ribosome releases the uh, fully folded protein into the cytoplasm or into the extracellular fluid or wherever the protein is gonna end up, uh, that's not necessarily the end of the story for the protein. So we actually have ways of further modifying the protein as a means of changing its function. And these kinds of chemical modifications that occur after translation are called post-translational modifications, or PTMs for short. So the idea here is that uh, chemically modifying a protein even after it has already been synthesized and folded can do a lot of different things to change the function of that particular protein. So we can either uh, enhance enzyme activity, we can inhibit enzyme activity, basically we can turn an enzyme on or off, uh, we can uh, target or tag a protein for destruction, we can uh, tag a protein so that it can get started on an important physiological mechanism. So there's actually quite a few different things that we can do to proteins to change their function just by tagging them with a small little chemical modifier. Now, there is a laundry list of different kinds of post-translational post modifications that can occur. The ones that you're seeing here in this chart are just some of the more common ones, but by no means is this an extensive list. So the idea behind how these modifications occur is that you have to remember that proteins are exposing a number of different chemical functional groups, either at their N terminus for amino groups, C terminus for carboxyl groups, and then you have a number of side chains that expose different chemical groups such as, again, carboxyl or amino groups, hydroxyl groups in the cases of things like serine and tyrosine and threonine, uh, you've got uh, some hydrophobic groups, so there are a lot of different uh, places on the protein that we can attach a number of different chemical modifiers. So, for example, probably the most common type of uh, post-translational modification is phosphorylation. And in order for a protein to be phosphorylated, this modification can only occur at th these three amino acid side chains those being serine, threonine, or tyrosine, the only side chains that have a hydroxyl functional group. Acetylation is another fairly common one. This can either occur at the N terminus of the protein or on the side chains of lysine or arginine, two side chains that also have amino groups. Ubiquitination is one that we will talk about later on in a different section. We won't talk about it so much in this section, but this specifically gets attached to lysine uh, side chains. Uh, and then glycosylation, another one that is fairly common, uh, especially for uh, membrane proteins that uh, are exposed to the outside of the cell. Uh, sugar groups uh, for glycosylation get attached to a number of different side chains, such as those for asparagine, serine, threonine, or tyrosine. So there are quite a few different post-translational modifications that we could talk about, and we could waste many, many hours doing so. But the main thing that you should take away from this particular slide is that depending on what the post-translational modifier is, those modifiers generally have a preference for which kind of functional group they like to react with. So that's why you're seeing things like ubiquitination, which can only occur at lysine groups, acetylation, which can only occur at amino groups. So it's not like we can modify a protein anywhere we want. There has to be some specificity there that is inherent to the actual amino acid sequence of the protein.
Uh, so let's start talking about acetylation first. So it actually has been estimated that somewhere around four-fifths of all proteins in the cell actually have an acetyl group at their end terminus, meaning that not long after these proteins are released from the ribosome, an enzyme will actually enzymatically attach an acetyl group to the end terminus of the protein onto that methionine residue. So if 80% of all the proteins in the cell have this, it must be a pretty important modifier. So what is currently thought is that this has to do with prolonging the lifespan of the protein. As it turns out that non-acetylated proteins, the ones that do not have this modifier, they tend to be very short-lived in the cell, meaning that not long after they are synthesized, they get degraded or uh, destroyed in some way. So as a means of allowing proteins to uh, perform their function for a longer period of time, uh, proteins often will receive this acetylation modifier. So later on in the semester, and even later on in this chapter a little bit, we'll talk about the idea of proteins not lasting for forever, and there having to be a balance struck between new protein synthesis and protein degradation. So much later in the semester, we'll have a little bit more of an, a discussion on experimental ways to estimate how long a protein likes to stay around in the cell. Uh, and usually the metric that we use is called the protein's half-life, or the amount of time it takes for 50% of that particular protein to be degraded over time. Okay, and then I mentioned that uh, one of by far the most common types of post-translational modifications is called phosphorylation. So many proteins, particularly enzymes, you, particular, you particularly see this modifier added to enzymes. The idea here is that phosphorylation is essentially acting like a switch, kind of like you can flip a switch to turn on a light or you can flip a switch to turn off a light. Phosphorylation very often will be a switch-like modifier that either turns on an enzyme or shuts it off. So the phosphate group that actually makes up this chemical modifier has to come from a molecule of ATP. And to get the transfer of this phosphate group to occur, we need enzymes to actually do this. So we actually have classes of enzymes whose sole job is to transfer, transfer phosphate groups uh, from ATP molecules and onto the serine, threonine, or tyrosine side chains of a particular protein. The type of enzyme that transfers these phosphate groups onto a protein are called kinase enzymes. There are many, many, many different kinds of kinase enzymes that are produced by the cell, and as you can imagine, they play an important role in regulating many processes by either shutting enzymes off or turning them on. Another class of enzymes does the exact opposite, and these are called phosphatase enzymes. They take a protein that has already been phosphorylated, and they remove the phosphate to return the protein to its unmodified form. So in this diagram, you can see that the phosphate addition, like I said, it really acts like a switch. The addition of a phosphate can either turn on an enzyme or it could shut it off. So you will sometimes see examples of proteins that are active when they have a phosphate group or are inactive when they have a phosphate group. It's kind of a contextual uh, thing that you have to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. So look at this example right here. Let's look at an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase. This is actually a multi-subunit enzyme that is made up of many, many protein subunits. So this enzyme is very important because it regulates entry of metabolites into the Krebs cycle, which is an important part of cellular respiration and the cell's ability to make energy for itself. This enzyme is only capable of doing its job when it is dephosphorylated, meaning it does not have a phosphate modifier. So the idea here is that there are kinases and phosphatases called PDH kinase and PDH phosphatase that help to regulate when this enzyme is active and when it is not. The idea is that when the cell has lots of energy already and doesn't really need any more, then the kinase becomes active and phosphorylates this enzyme to shut it off until such a time where we need more energy and we need more flux through this pathway, at which case the phosphatase will remove the phosphate, turn the enzyme back on, and allow it to become active again so that we can replenish our energy stores inside the cell.
So that's about it as far as uh, specific examples of post-translational modifications. We will talk about ubiquitination in the next uh, uh, section of this uh, lecture. So we're not totally done talking about post-translational modifications, but I think at this point you probably get the general idea behind what a post-translational modification is capable of doing. Now, the last thing that we want to say are some practical considerations when you're working with proteins and you suspect that your protein may receive a post-translational modification. So a couple of things to consider here. Uh, so if you're purifying or, uh, or, or otherwise working with your protein of interest, how do you preserve the post-translational modification after the cell has been lysed? So if you're lysing cells and you're trying to collect your protein, is there a way to make sure that that post-translational modification stays there? Now, in the case of uh, proteins that get phosphorylated, a lot of times if you lyse the cell carelessly, you may activate phosphatases that can pluck that phosphate right off of your proteins. So a lot of companies actually sell mixtures or cocktails that can be added to your lysis buffer that will inhibit the activity of these phosphatase enzymes and make sure that your protein stays phosphorylated. And these cocktails are relatively inexpensive and easy to obtain. So whether you add one of these cocktails to your lysis buffer, it's just going to depend on whether your protein that you're interested in is phosphorylated and whether you want to preserve that modification. Okay, so what about the other issue? If your protein is modified, how do you show that it actually has been modified? How do you prove that? So there are a number of techniques later in the semester. We're not quite ready to talk about these just yet, but just know that there are techniques like mass spectrometry or antibody technologies that can actually show that a specific, specific chemical modification has occurred. So we will have more to say about those techniques later in the semester. So we'll circle back to this discussion when it becomes appropriate to do so. Okay, so that was not a terribly long lecture, so we'll go ahead and cut it off there for now. Uh, so next, uh, in the next video, we are going to start talking about how proteins get degraded in the cell. And specifically, we're going to talk about a type of post-translational modification that is important for that called ubiquitination. So we'll go ahead and cut it off here for now. I will see you next time. So